Hi guys. Well, it should be an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, and I do mean an over-the-top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this what should be a glorious Friday morning, June 30th. Uh, we are one half of June 30th, 2023. We are one half of the way through 2023 today. And, uh, of course, we have one reason why it's not a spectacularly gorgeous day. But we are not going to get into a wildfire smoke rant because I have the great pleasure for the second time uh, bringing on to Collapse Chronicles my... My good buddy and fellow collapsitarian, Jeremy Jimenez, who is, uh, I have interviewed Jeremy before, so if you want to hear our, uh, our more general interview about who this man is and his worldview on collapse and stuff, you can, I will put the link and you can uh, go listen to that, but Jeremy, I'm going to, he is a professor at, uh, <clears throat> SUNY, oops, State University of New York in Cortland, New York, and I'm going to go grab this little dog so he's not barking at chippies all through our, no, no chippy chasing, we don't want to listen to barking all through the interview. Uh, so Jeremy, just give us uh, a, a brief recap of who you are and then what we're going to talk about is Jeremy has just returned from a long visit to uh, Madagascar and I am just curious to get a Doomer International Studies professor's opinion on uh, the state of Madagascar in the year 2023 and any other his travels he wants to talk about. So Jeremy, come on, say hi to the folks, give us a brief introduction, and just dive into what did you do on your summer vacation. Hello, Doomosphere Collapsitarians. A special shout out to the local Doomer and Doomer Jasons. Sandy, Basil, Karen, how's it going? Um, yeah, so I'm Associate Professor at SUNY Cortland. I teach mostly future teachers. I teach uh, kind of general courses, uh, international education, race class, gender studies education, foundation of education. Uh, I kind of incorporate ecological thinking into all my classes. So that's kind of like my, the niche focus I have. Um, so yeah, I uh, just got back from Madagascar in Comoros, uh, but wait, wait for about a month. Um, I guess the first thing you notice is as you're flying into the country, I came in actually from Mauritius and, uh, yeah, a lot of deforestation. It's just kind of hills and hills and hills of just brown and no trees. Um, and then, you know, you land in the capital, and then pretty soon we, we, we went to Morondova, which is on the west coast. And it is interesting, the baobab trees are doing great. There are baobabs aplenty. Um, all along the way, we drove up this road, maybe like the second worst road I've been on, I think. Nothing's worse than the Congo, but this was a pretty bad road. Um, you know, frequently cars stuck in the ditch, got to push it. But baobab's everywhere. And I think uh, one of the, my guy was telling me that baobab doesn't really have any human uses of the wood. It's like really bad wood for processing things. So he thinks the reason why the baobabs are still there is not because, you know, people have a special understanding of forest preservation. Although, to be fair, they, they do actually consider the largest baobab spiritual, and they actually kind of do intentionally protect the largest ones. But in general, it's not useful to humans, so they leave it there. There you go. <laughs> they do actually, they do make a jam out of it, um, which I was very happy. It seemed very sustainable, the local jam from the baobab. But I feel like it tastes, if, if I had to describe baobab jam, imagine you had strawberry jam with like mustard mixed into it. That's kind of what it tastes like. So yeah, I wasn't the biggest fan of that jam, but... um. But yeah, so the baobabs are, are doing all right. How about the rest of the uh, rainforest? And yeah, of course, you know, I don't have a baseline of comparison, yeah. right, from what it was or what it could be. Um, I will say the forests I went to, like I went to Kurindi Forest and some other near ones to check out the lemurs, um, forests generally seem to do relatively okay where there were forests. 
Um, plenty of lemurs everywhere bouncing around. Um, but yeah, but there's just not a whole lot of the country which is forested is the issue. So where there are trees, they're doing well. Uh, not like here upstate New York, right? You're driving through and you just see dead trees all over the place. Um, you don't see a lot of dead trees there. You just don't see a large mass of trees, I guess, <laughs> is, is the issue. So the three percent of the forest that is still standing seems to be fairly uh, seems to be doing okay, hanging uh, in there. Uh, 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 unlike right around uh, right around inside of us from right here. Uh, yeah, and I would often ask about invasive species in the forest, the guides, and yeah, apparently they don't have too much of a problem of invasive species. And I thought maybe maybe because there's not as many tourists going to Madagascar as I thought there would be. I had assumed, okay, everyone knows Madagascar is the most, you know, diverse flora and fauna in the world, you know, places you don't see anywhere else, plants, animals, lemurs, etc. Um, but there were so few tourists there, actually. And even though it's kind of nearing the height of the tourist season when I went, um, yeah, I mean, we'd stay at these, like, rustic lodges and, you know, there'd be a handful of other people there, you know, almost all Germans, actually, mostly Germans. Um, but, yeah. So what was your your goal of going there simply to cross it off your bucket list or were you, were you going there with a specific uh... well yeah i am i am a i've been a lifelong country collector um i had a goal at the age of 19 after spending a summer in costa rica i want to go to every country in the world and i said like no matter what i'm gonna add five to ten new countries every year it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if i don't have the money it doesn't matter if it ends my relationship i'm gonna do it I want to see the world. I want to interact with others. I want to kind of document what's happening, like socially, politically, economically, ecologically in other countries. I want to be able to learn that so I could teach about it, you know, both through pictures, through stories, etc. Uh, and so it's just kind of this thing I've just, I, I haven't even been thoughtful about. I just kind of, like, okay, next year, where am I going to go? And, but, I, but I'm winding down now. I kind of, I don't think I'm going to aim for going to the mall. It just kind of seems like it's diminishing marginal returns basically been to everywhere except antarctica um but madagascar was always in my mind as this like really special interesting place um and so that you know as i'm winding down and just want to go to a few more places i wanted to make sure i got to madagascar and um yeah and uh so that was i was very keen to see both the lemurs and just the kind of unique plant life and yeah it is pretty much you walk around and you see all sorts of uh, flora that I've never seen elsewhere, which is pretty cool. Although, having traveled to Mauritius, Comoros, and Madagascar, there is a lot of similarity between the three. I guess there's been a lot of plant exchange between those three places. Um, but yeah, it's uh, what else about Madagascar? Um, people living pretty, you know, pre-industrial outside the cities. Uh, just your kind of classic African village. Um, so I don't even know what is the capital of Madagascar. Uh, it's called, the official name is Antanarivo, but everyone calls it Tana. Um, is, is, it a, is it a serious pit from hell? or? No, as far as like, you know, <laughs> these capitals go, it's not so bad. Um, it's actually surprisingly agricultural. You drive from the airport to the main part of the city and there's actually so many people growing crops and and uh, what do they call the the sea, the zebus the they the cows with the big humps yeah, yeah um so there's actually a lot of it's, it's a very agricultural country um and outside that main capital like the other cities are like really small uh affairs um yeah and it's, it's a rural country for the most part and i would say other than like the very obvious imported bags of rice people pretty much are living off what they grow all across the country, it seems. Um, though I've, I've, I've talked to some people to say there are some issues where places it's getting harder to grow food, you know, the different groups from different parts of the country are migrating to the places where you can grow food. And it's not yet at a like, crisis level, but my guide was telling me, yeah, yeah there's Well, didn't concerns. they have a really awful drought there last year? Yeah, did, yeah. Did they come out of that, or is it still ongoing? Uh, I, I couldn't tell any, see any signs of, like, people being undernourished or famished where I went. I was in the center of the country and the west of the country. Um, maybe the famine might have been more in the east of the country, perhaps. But, um, yeah, I had heard too. But, no, there was, from my view, there was no sign that, like, people were not getting by um, from my limited window where I went. Um, but, yeah, then, then I also went to Comoros. And Comoros is interesting. Uh, 
I, I was pretty much like the only tourist there for a week. I mean, I met one other guy in, in the, the lodge I was staying at. Um, and so no tourists go there. It's this beautiful island. Um, but like one thing that actually I think also makes traveling harder over time, like psychologically, is like just the plastic trash. I mean, and I don't, and I don't even think most of it's being generated by the people there. I think it's a mix of that and just stuff that kind of like circulates in the ocean and ship cruise ships, etc. But um, yeah, I mean, you see these beautiful pristine beaches, and then there's just plastic garbage yeah, everywhere, yeah. and car husks too. There's like. I actually, I, might, I put together an album like the car apocalypse of Comoros, and it's just like, I guess you know we, you know, it's on Saint Croix, yeah, same, same thing, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, islands. you're you're a low income country. You don't have the space nor the money to ship away your car husks, nor recycle them, or do anything with them. So it's just like, yeah, massive car husks all across the country, all along the beach, all along the road, um, but. But that being said, the other thing too, which was stands out, so I was trying to both save time, money. I would walk to the beach. It was like a 30 minute walk from my place to the nearest beach. And um, holy shit, the heat, man. Oh my God. It's like nine in the morning and just dripping, dripping sweat all the time. And as soon as you get out of the shade, like it's a, it's yeah. like you're in the shade, it's bearable. The sun is just like, oh, I can't, I mean, I, I've experienced heat like that before in Myanmar and other places, but, um, yeah, I, I also, yeah, I feel like it's becoming palpable. Those even few degrees rise of temperature is just making a lot of these places like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess because I'm not from there and I haven't adapted, but people seem to be doing fine walking around. But man, yeah, I was just, the, the heat was so oppressive. In Comoros. So how was the plastic trash just walking to the beach? Yeah, so it's like there's, it's you, it's not so bad like right on the roadside, but then it's just kind of you look over into like the various beaches and rocky areas and it's just, it's just such large collections of it that's so See, yeah, that, that's the absolute flip side of what I experienced in the Yucatan uh, last year because Rumpelstiltskin, you know, comes out at 4 o'clock in the morning. So you're, you're on the beach and, they're, and you don't see the plastic trash. But as soon as you get one block off the tourist, where, you know, where the tourists go spending their money, you get one block. And it's it's just a, an an open, uh, just an open landfill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as you as far as you're walking, uh, for mile after mile, and uh, so so you're so you started traveling how many years ago? You're for, you're 46 now. So how many years have you been? I've, I've been on the road since uh, 96. Yeah, I just, just turned adult, and I'm like, that's it. I'm going to go see the world. And it just started off a trip to Costa Rica, and then, yeah, I just, just kind of kept going and kept grinding away. Um, so so 27 years. So you've been to how many other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa? Oh, in, to, in Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, have you done them all now? No, I would say there's... Some of the hardest places to get to cost-wise, time-wise, is are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because, you know, when no one goes to Chad, uh, <laughs> you can't really get a bargain flight there. There's no, like, convenient buses from a neighboring country. The visas are often super complicated and expensive. So you, you've missed Chad. I've missed Chad, yeah. No offense to, to any Chadians. Uh, um, but, yeah, I, I'd say probably in Sub-Saharan Africa, I've probably been to... Well, I've been to 165 countries. There are 195 or so, according to the UN. Um, Non-African countries I haven't been to is probably like 10. So I've probably been to 30, 35 sub-Saharan African countries, I guess is my estimate. See, I was in uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania back in 1972. And... You know, I, I was a 12-year-old kid, so it, I, I wasn't really on the lookout, but I have no memory of plastic right. garbage in the landscape. I have no memory, and I honestly don't think in 1972 in those three countries that that people were running around cleaning up the plastic to the tourists. <coughs> 
didn't see it, but what, what I do remember is just the hordes of little kids. Uh, d d d just unbelievable. And, and I'm, uh, so what is your, <coughs> just give your general impression of, of, of the, the population and overpopulation, I think, what is like over half of sub-Saharan Africa is like under the age of 15 or some ridiculous, horrible statistic. It's a young place. How have, over the years, just whether that or the plastic or the deforestation, uh, what is your general impression, you know, obviously here on Collapse Chronicles, uh, we want to hear about, just how would you characterize over the past 20 years traveling around the planet, how things have gone uh, downhill? Yeah, I think the first time I remember being disgusted by plastic on the beach was actually, I think, in, was it? bar or Montenegro, Serb like Serbia or Montenegro, and I remember even judging like, oh, these people don't care for the beach, and, and I realized actually a lot of times it's not the individual people that live there, it just washes up, right, from the whole system. Um, but yeah, I think what's becoming more uh, noticeable over the years of traveling is the dense urbanization as kind of... Um, it either becomes too hot to grow food or the storms and saltwater intrusion destroy the capacity for food, um, that more and more people are flocking to cities, the cities are getting more dense, more crowded, um, and knowing that none of these large urban centers could possibly exist without fossil fuels, like, that's the really frightening thing, right? Because as, as people flee for, to make a living, because they can no longer make a living in the rural areas for various reasons, they go to the cities, but then they're migrating to these m massive megalopolis cities that actually can't imagine them really existing, you know, in a few decades from now. Um, so, yeah, so that, that kind of dense urbanization. And then, of course, all the air pollution, right? Like, we're, we're, well, we we're, we're bitching about this, in this, in this, a, this, this air pollution here. Like, this is like a good day in Dhaka, Bangladesh, right? Like, you would be grateful to have a day of 120 uh, AQI, um, and, and Dr. Bangladesh, because yeah, the, 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 when I was there, it was like 300, 400, like pretty much every day. Yeah, so that's the other, the other thing is the air pollution, right? Is that like, we're finally hit oh. here, right? Like we thought we picked the, the place that would survive for at least maybe 10 years or more without the, the forest fire pollution. But um, yeah, I mean, what we're now finally hit has hit us home here in upstate New York has been, is the world, right? Like the world is that. Almost everywhere is this terrible air quality, um, either directly from, you know, industry or indirectly from burning f forest fires in the adjacent places. Um, so yeah, that stands but out. But you would be glad to have this in Dhaka. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. This would be a, a day to go out and enjoy and take deep breaths if you're, you're in Dhaka, Bangladesh. <laughs> yeah. Now, I have never been to Lagos, my dear. Have you been to Lagos? I just transited the airport. Yeah, I never, never. Oh, you say you never, you never really uh, got into Lagos. Not got no, traffic jam. I, I always just, uh, and n not jokingly, I, I'm just trying to think of the the <coughs> epicenter <coughs> hellhole <coughs> on the planet, and I always default to Lagos, Nigeria. So I was hoping you'd been there. So, but you've been to a lot of hell halls. Yeah. Does, does Dhaka, is Bangladesh, is, is it, the, is it the, the pit of hell, the literal pit of hell on this planet? Well, no, like... That you've seen. The, the air pollution stood up particularly, but it wasn't like, um, and obviously traffic's like absurdly terrible. You, you got to wait hours to get anywhere. You usually walk to places faster. Um, but yeah, it didn't feel, I mean, I, I grew up my whole life in urban areas, right? So I guess like, Nothing stood out as being like hellhole, although you can clearly read into the future of, of what, what is DACA's future. Um, but yeah, places that I felt were, I remember actually, well, the Guatemala City, I mean, as oh, much, that's up there. Oh, yeah, I mean, Guatemala itself, of course, is gorgeous and the mountains and, and all that, but um, Lake La Guatitlan, but the, that, I remember Guatemala oh, City God. just like black, like you literally see black plumes of smoke yeah, yeah. wafting over you. Uh, uh, so that stood out as being hellish uh 
Yeah, what are other like really? Well, uh, Lima, Peru is it for me? Uh, the the eastern slums of, of Lima, Peru, just just. I I I I mean, just hell. I, I didn't understand why anyone who woke up to that and that was their lifestyle I didn't put a bullet in their head. Yeah, and and why I what really like <laughs> I can't believe how many people keep talking about like urban areas as being the more sustainable version. Um, like this idea, no, we're going to build smart cities, and oh, people aren't <laughs> driving and commuting. They you know they're walking. I'm like. But everything about a large city needs fossil fuels, right? You know, where, where, where you, how are you getting in and out of the food with the trucks and the trash? Um, you know, your grid, you're obviously not powering a full city grid on solar panels. Um, and so, like, as someone who grew up in an urban area and I, I'm, you know, I'm very invested in urban education and improve the quality of it, like, at the same time, like, I know, like, big cities will have to be abandoned, right? Like, they will be abandoned eventually this century sometime. Um, what's that going to look like? Yeah, and, and if, if we, but we can't even, if we're not even having this conversation of like what happens when the big cities will naturally be abandoned because you can no longer feed yourself in them because there's no longer reliable fossil fuels to power a city. Um, what you're going to have is like, yeah, you have the situation, well, you know, in, in this country, for example, um, most people in rural areas are white, right, uh, who own these large tracts of rural land, and what's going to happen when a lot of people of color living in cities, you know, need to leave the cities. Um, it'd be great if we could have a conversation about that now, about kind of working to depopulate cities and encourage people. But um, yeah, I, I'm, it, is, uh, it is scary to think about what, what's going to happen when cities all across the world can no longer support populations um, without the fossil fuels. Your vision of this is... is Twenty years from now, thirty. What? what <clears throat> Twenty fifty. Uh, as as a, some of the cities you've been to, uh, w w watching this progression, when when are we going to hit the wall? Yeah, I mean, I guess we, we there's so much we don't know about how much oil is actually left, right, and how much uh, is of it the reserves accessible, right? Big oil producing countries, it's their incentive to kind of overplay their hands or be mysterious about it because they'll lose investment if they kind of be honest about their dwindling reserves. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I've seen various estimates, you know, peak oil, et cetera. Obviously, there's a lot of complexity there. And uh, But one thing I think, I was like, this guy, Art Berman, he does some really good talks on oil. And he talks about, like, even if you look at the what's what we call oil, a lot of what we call oil is actually really natural gas, but it's still being, like, referred to as like growth in oil fossil fuels and that natural gas of course has many uses industry wise but nothing like oil right there is no you don't get diesel from natural gas and basically all the trucks in the world run on diesel all the food delivered to all the supermarkets is on diesel um so you know that when's that gonna ha yeah oh who knows it's it's coming it's coming um if i had a ballpark it somewhere between 10 and 30 years we're going to start to see serious deprivations from the lack of availability of fossil fuels to fund modern living and, and of course, good riddance, right? Good riddance to this bullshit called modernity. Um, but, of course, the, the transition is not going to look the, pretty. The transition is uh... it's going to be tough. Hard or horror, I believe you once said in an interview. Who an interviewer shared that? Perspective. Yeah, if you want to hear his hard or horror, uh, that those are our, our two choices. We expound upon uh, upon that. And by the way, having coined Doomer adjacent, I don't want you to in future discussions to conflate Doomer adjacent to apocalyptimist. I believe they are separate categories, right? I believe if you're Doomer adjacent, you're saying hard or horror are the choices, but there's things we can do individually, collectively to navigate that difference. The apocalyptimist is things are bad, but somehow human will is going to find a way to get out of this problem. So, yeah, just to be clear, as a Doomer adjacent, I am not an apocalyptimist. Um, I feel closer to a Doomer than an apocalyptimist, but I'm not ready to just, you know, just get out there and enjoy it while we still can. I still have seven types of composting in my house to improve soil quality for my little niche of the world. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, of course, do also get out there and enjoy it while you can, now, especially if you're young. I, I hope you don't get, uh, because you, you know it's going to come up in the comments, Jeremy. 
the what the the air JC? travel. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So this man, he's almost a vegan. Uh, the number one most important thing, he's not a breeder. <laughs> the, the, thank God, uh, I have, uh, we all thank you, the planet thanks you. The man is not a breeder, so he has, as far as I'm concerned, a pass to do it every way. He's not a breeder, that's number one. You drive a Prius? A Prius, yeah. He drives a Prius. He's mostly a vegan. You compost, you raise earthworms. And I think you still have a mower, a, hand mower, a yeah. rotary mower. Yeah, yeah, a human-powered mower. Yeah, with I, I'm, we're not by, by rotor. I'm talking one of those things. <laughs> you don't even you don't have a gas sucking no. or an electric yeah. mower. Okay, you have a human-powered lawn mower. So this man, on every level, he's you know chalking up the uh, individual that he obviously believes and individual uh, consumer and lifestyle choices. And then you were telling me last night, you think you've been to, what was the nine, what was the airport statistic that you shared with me last night? Oh, well, whether or not to, to count airports or? You but mean? you said that you've been in 90% of the- Oh yeah, uh, by, the, by the end of this summer, I will have been to 90% of the airport capitals of the world. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, okay, just, just I mean, seriously, yeah. how do you uh, navigate that? Yeah, navigate, that. navigate. You have all of this stuff on one side of your consumer and lifestyle, responsible steward of the planet, and then you have the air, the air travel. So how do you explain this? To, when you get called on it well clearly like all people rationalization right yeah. that's, that's that's the name of the game <laughs> uh well obviously so most of my life traveling i would probably put myself in the apocalyptic camp right like oh yeah climate change is something's going to impact the grand the grandchildren um but you know with solar energy and other things we can offset and you know buy your green permits so like i deluded myself for, for the large portion of my life air travel with that. So you're taking the Bill Gates, uh, uh, the Bill Gates that's, That out. was my, my, my <laughs> view, yeah. Then I actually started to be conscious, of, okay, Jeremy, that's the one thing, you're really flying a lot, you're throwing all that carbon, blah, 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 you should check that privilege and do your part to, to back off. Uh, and I actually was like, you're right, I'm gonna seriously cut it down. Then Corona hit, and then we're all in lockdown and then like i'm just like twiddling my thumbs alone in my house and uh finally i'm like no i i can't do this anymore i'm going crazy i need to just get out and stuff so then i'm like i'm still gonna travel i'm gonna fly but i'm gonna you know go to just a couple more places that i really want to go to and the last was one of the rationalizations was like well on the short term you're cooling the planet, right? Because the air emissions oh, yeah. actually block sun up in the stratosphere you or whatever. Are really, so uh, you're, you're, <laughs> I'm doing my part to temporarily the, to slow the down the. the trails, right. <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, obviously, yeah, it's we're we're all human. We 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 carbon sin and environmentally sin in different ways. Uh, that's my sin. Uh, I limit it, but clearly I still do it, and I rationalize it, and I'm like, well, you know, I. I feel better about it. I still it informs my teaching. Uh, I get to interact with others, learn from others, uh, use my disposable income to drop it off in low-income countries. So some people there have a better chance of, of surviving. Um, but yeah, of course there are rationalizations. I'm aware of that. Well, and um, and you did not mention the one I always mention: the the damn plane would be flying to Madagascar whether I was on it or not. Right, I guess, and some of, uh, some, well, some will respond, you actually wait on the plane, burns a little more fuel, yeah, right? Because, uh, but yeah, obviously the, it's the, the plane, plane itself. The plane is going to Madagascar. Yeah. It, it, it is, uh, now, I, I, I mean, I fly like 3% as much as this man. Uh, but that's my rationalization. Whether, whether there's a few environmentally correct doomers thinking their consumer and lifestyle choices are, are, are still going to make an impact on the downward trajectory of, of, of this planet by, by not flying. You know, they just had the big, the single biggest order of jumbo jets two weeks ago yeah, I announced that. at the Paris, in human history. 
in yeah. human history, two weeks ago, 500 more uh, uh, of these in, in one order. And, uh, and, and that just broke the record. The previous record was set in, I think, February, where it was 450. So, uh, I, I mean, just, just this year, 1,000 more uh, uh, of these jumbo jets. And that, that, I mean, that's my rationalization, that the, the system is bigger than we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, that's the, uh, I guess we, we can mention the, this name occasionally on the show, the Guy McPherson cop-out. Uh, there's not many, th well, actually I agree with 99% of what that, what that idiot says, but uh, that's one of them. I, I mean, he flies all over this planet. Uh, and, yeah, and I guess, too, like, if you take, like, Tim Garrett, you know, and others who talked about, you know, make a very convincing case, like, if the energy is available, it's going to be used, right? Yeah. And if you stop flying, well, what you really just did is you minusculely lowered the price of fuel, making it more available by others to consume it, supply and demand, et cetera. Uh, um, so I guess, too, when I, when I think about my environmental advocacy, especially with my students and, and people I talk to, is let's get out of this carbon emissions thing, right? Because the carbon emissions thing, like the oil is going to be used. Like we're, we're going to use all the oil definitely. Like there's no way we're not going to extract the oil that we actually can use and we're going to burn it all, right? So it's going to all get burnt. Maybe it could be a little bit burned a little slower, but it's going to get burnt. But we I are not going to leave it in the ground. But I'd like to think of more, what are the kind of ecological restoration things you can do that will make the earth more livable when the fossil fuel runs out and once we've done all this ecological education and the global warming rate, we're going to get this significant global warming continuing for decades to come. We're going to get continued ecological devastation, but if we could think of advocacy when you do things like compost and restore wetlands and, um, and you know, grow your own food, eat the own weeds in your backyard, like these are kind of like regenerative things that of course they're not going to offset the damage done, uh, but they'll mitigate, right? They'll they'll limit it, and you know it's if we can make the planet a little more livable for other species and future generations, like that seems like a good way to make some sacrifices. But being very honest with yourself, that yeah, you can only you know the dam's going to break, but you can maybe help some future generations of species prepare for have higher ground by having somewhat healthier soil and landscapes and biodiversity where possible. Yeah. So in your travels, now, now you probably seek out certain people to have this conversation with. So not counting those people, just, just what is, what would you say is your general impression traveling all around this world, just meeting, meeting people from, what percentage of the conversations you have with people on this planet have anything to do with what you said in the last five minutes? Do you uh, ever have this conversation? I would say others bring it up almost never. Uh, maybe 1% of the conversations someone I talk to, they bring yeah. it up. Uh, I bring it up frequently, even if it's just a kind of like a Doomer one-liner. I, I have no problem giving Doomer one-liners to strangers I meet hero about like you know like, oh well when the oil runs out you know like uh, you know we're gonna have trouble feeding a population of eight billion um so five years ago i would drop comments like that uh and you know i'd get pushback i'd get rolled eyes i'd get like sighs you know all sorts of things like that you're being ridiculous you know there's ways to solve this i find increasingly and i don't know if like the because of how bad the headlines are, especially with global warming in recent uh, years um, or other things like biodiversity loss. I don't know if it's like uh, people became more reflective when coronavirus made them question everything and they had a lot of time to think. But I feel now when I drop those one-liners, there's much less pushback. There's just like not necessarily not much engagement. I don't get a lot of people, oh, what do you mean? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I just get this kind of more of a, like a shutdown maybe like a one sentence semi agreement before they change the subject yeah before they change the subject so <laughs> like it does seem people are kind of being more aware but also have i was this i was met this guy from zimbabwe uh over the summer just in a in a, in a bar in new york and he had no like he hadn't had any of these thoughts at all like none of these conversations 
And he actually was really interested. He was like asking me follow up questions, and I was just kind of like, "Oh yeah, well, this is what happens when you know when you lose your forest, and, and this is what happens when you two ecological systems cascades when you lose biodiversity." And he was like visibly shaken. Like he was like literally um, really curious, and even like ended the conversation with like, "I'm gonna give a lot of thought. I'd never thought this before, but I'm gonna give a lot of thought to where I want to live and how I want to raise my kid." you know, in the future. So, yeah, so I think um, there's, yeah, a little bit more noticeable acceptance in people all across the world, all ages, all backgrounds, to how bad things are, even if they themselves don't want to, like, bring it up or follow up. Has the subject of overpopulation ever been brought up by someone, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, in your travels? rarely overpopulation broadly but they'll be say things about like oh this place is getting too populated right like oh there's too many people moving to this city uh, or there's too many people you know now um, trying to farm in this limited area so seldom like looking at the whole global picture of 8 billion people but I'll get the local regional commentaries like oh yeah this place is now getting really crowded and it's getting hard to manage things. So, so yeah, so, so yeah, so I think the lens with which people will come in and analyze the studies are often local rather than you know seeing the big picture. I, d- I just want to say the uh, the the camera battery warning light is flashing and we have no indication with this camera from the front of the camera when it. When it clicks, so there's a chance that we're gonna gonna get cut off, uh, and it is what it is. So uh, let's look. So so, what is your next plan? As you mentioned to me last night, you're you're heading to Pop. Is it Papua? How do you pronounce that? I think it's Papua New Guinea. Yeah, Papua New Guinea. Uh, is there any element, particularly in that destination? Do you you've heard of the term disaster? Tourism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, is, is there any of your travel bug? Uh, disaster tourism. Disaster, because I think Papua New Guinea. It it, it sounds to me if if I had to pick a country that I think has most rapidly been. It, I, I'm surprised I don't rant about New Guinea more often. If I, if I had to think of a a country that has most rapidly been destroyed from paradise to hell hall would be uh, would, would be new, that the the amount of destruction that we have inflicted on one of the last probably the last gardens of Eden on this planet and is does that have any Appeal. Yeah, appeal on a sick doomer adjacent level, or do you have to be deeper a doomer? Well, I so, I guess like seeing human tragedy and misery like that isn't appealing at all. But well, two things are appealing. If people aren't going to a place because there's a disaster, usually it's cheaper, right? So it's certainly as a traveler, you can save money and, <laughs> and live better by going to places that other people are scared to go to Chat. because you realize that like of the hundred and sixty five countries I've been to, like. The most parts of most of these countries are safe. The exception is where I lived Venezuela for four years. Like, that's a place I would advise you not to go to <laughs> if you don't know someone there well, right? Um, but most places are safe. But the other part is, like, I love, I really love seeing plants take over human civilization, right? Like, I love it. Like, I just love walking through. And so some might say that, like, oh, you're going through a disaster place. You're, like, excited about the, like, the loss, the collapse of this local civilization or region i'm like no i love seeing nature reclaim well that's not what you're going to see in new guinea you're going to see the 180 degree opposite i think well so i don't know we're going to bring him back on uh when he gets back from new guinea yeah i don't know um what specifically is about the degraded landscape but i i do know this from the scuba diving community right because i you know i dove a lot and i dive a lot of places Apparently, the reef in Papua New Guinea is still among the best in the world. Um, last I heard, maybe that's changed. But to me, that's at least an indication of like lack of urbanization in Papua New Guinea has spared it 
from the, you know, the reef disasters that are kind of happening all over the world elsewhere. And again, I don't imagine, I imagine someone who scooped, scooped it over there 30 years ago will say it was much more pristine than, than today, of course. But, um, but I went to hear scuba reports of, oh, no, you got to go to popping in. The diving there is outstanding. To me, that suggests that it might be weathering a little better because other than Port Moresby, which I think that might be your Lagos from what I hear. Like, yeah, yeah. like I hear reports. I uh, yeah, yeah uh, there are things like, be, oh, yeah. like literally like watch your back every second as you're walking <laughs> the street. Other, what I read about there that unlike other places where they, where they say you got to watch your back, like no, most cities are fine watch your back for for extreme violence in this city city yes the city i expect will be a hellhole but outside of the city um from again from the limited people that go there they say oh no it's beautiful and the people are hospi hospitable and welcoming and there's no obvious signs of like ecological destruction so but yeah i'll certainly let you know My, i will uh... be both in the city and, and rural areas there so now i have never been to new guinea or madagascar My this is just my doomer feeling. Mm. So you've been to Madagascar, yes. but you haven't been to New Guinea yet. Right. Uh, my guess is when you get to New Guinea, what you're going to be flying into is what Madagascar was 30 years ago. Maybe. So yeah. when you're flying into New Guinea, remember, remember like what I said, that... The shifting baselines. Uh, yeah, the shifting yeah. baselines. When you're flying in there, what I want you to think of is in 2050, right. assuming there's still airplanes flying, that someone flying into this airport is going to see what I saw flying into the, uh, in, 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 into the Madagascar airport. That's my, that's my feeling. And so I'm really looking forward to his report on, on, uh, on, on New Guinea to see now that I've seeded him with that disaster tourism, if, if he agrees with me. How long are you going to spend in New Guinea? You can, I think I'm uh, 10 days. 10 days, so that'll give yeah. you a, okay, a, a, a. Somewhat a little, little snapshot, small snapshot of the country. So um, there's, so Papua is, is actually owned by, it's part of Indonesia, right? No, so there's, uh, West Papua is, is part of Indonesia, but, the rest of it is independent country. So there's, yeah, the, the most western part of the Indonesian system of islands, I think is called West Papua, and that, that's yeah. part of Indonesia. They're fighting for their independence, you know, or have been for decades. Um, well, I think that's where, because since Indonesia has been so already environmentally raped, that yeah. that it is right now is where the uh, most active deforestation, and I'm sure palm oil, has got to be. Oh, I mean, that, I, I'm just I'm just assuming. You imagine Pop, Palmo is probably slowly working its way into Papua New Guinea. Nothing slowly about it. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. My my uh, guess is you're going to see uh, again. Just let me know how how well I did. That, that, and this is purely intuition, guys. That you're going to see thousands of acres of baby oil um, palm trees. I'll certainly look out for that, especially when flying in if it's a clear Yeah, day. You, uh, will, you will see entire valleys with palm oil trees about three feet tall. That won't even, st that'll start producing, you know, in three or four years from now. Yeah, and yeah, Indonesia is, is I, I, I did research in Singapore and uh, you could find papers I published interviewing teaching students in Singaporean schools. Um, but yeah, they often, their wildfires, then they complain about the wildfires it would be the Indonesian wildfires, right? Just how bad they are and all the, both the intentional and the unintentional burning there. Yeah, it's particularly, particularly horrific and, and tragic, definitely. So I'm, yeah, that's what, I, you know, I've been reading in Manga Bay uh, all these years about the Indonesian haze from the wildfires. But that's where they're setting the, those fires on, you know, to burn off yeah. their farm fields. So it's a little bit different. But is have you ever been in one of those haze events in Indonesia? Have you been there at that time of year um, to compare it to what's happening right here today in front of it? It's hard to know because, like, so much of South Asia is just terrible air pollution everywhere. So it's, like, hard to know is this, coming like... Coming from what? I, oh, it's coming from China factories, especially... 
uh, coming from dust storms, uh, coming from uh, urban pollution and cars, coming from intentional fire set. Um, it's just like from, you know, Pakistan. I, I traveled with Pakistan all the way to Indonesia, right? They like, went all across mm -hmm. there. And like, it's just awful air quality, like everywhere. Like, again, a day like today is like a good day in much of Southeast and South Asia. So... Yeah, and I think it's that's also the pot, right. If you look at those maps of population density, you often talk about something in Africa, but you're talking about population density. It's yeah. much scarier South Southeast Asia yeah, because it's yeah. such a larger cluster of people and living in urbanized conditions. As the sea levels are rising and washing away places like Vietnam, and and the salt intrusion is going to wipe out the rice paddies. Um, yeah, I, I would be. And the heat, right? The the yeah, oppressive, yeah. oppressive. Oh God, what's like, going on now? Yeah, like I mean, Singapore. Yeah, like yeah. It's well, a, what is the the heat index where you're heading right now? I hadn't even thought about that. Is New Guinea have? Is it into this? Is it part of this? I haven't looked, but part of the reason why I was keen to do this trip is like I knew the El Nino's coming, and who knows how bad, right? Ellie Jacobs said you look at all his graphs about like the how already sea surface temperatures and. Uh, glacier melt, etc. Um, how bad it is. I was actually thinking, like, what if we really have this extreme, unbearable period of heat coming these next couple of years? I better get in a, a one more tropical trip while I still can. So I was actually very consciously thinking, visit these countries now, because who knows next summer, they might actually be like, unsafe to visit if you don't have like, reliable air conditioning in, yeah. in some of these places yeah but at least that's not the problem in uh in the finger lakes of new york no since we are yeah. one of the, the, the only the cool, outliers the only on yeah the, the only cooling trend place uh this whole in the whole planet yeah yeah and we were talking earlier yeah is it does this is this air pollution causing the cooling uh maybe someone a climate person can weigh on it if they think this finger lakes cooling trend that june's been quite cool is it all these Canadian wildfires? Of it? And by the way, speaking of Canadian, Paul Beckwith, all right, you make some great videos. You got to get on this, man, right? You're Canadian. You're from there. You got you to gotta rake those twigs. You know, <laughs> do what you, you got to do your part, Paul, to, to stop this, all right? Because it's really, it's really, it's affecting Sam Bone's business here, you know? Um, so just, just Paul Beckwith. We're looking to you to solve the problem. I have had two can <laughs> two cancellations uh, in the in the past twelve hours uh, for my vacation. With that because people are, and this is uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, get out there, and uh, people should have gotten up here and enjoyed bugs in a.